Hello and welcome back to Noah's Window. Again, we're in the book of Romans and we are in chapter 6. And today we're going to pick up in verse 12. Paul says, Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have a new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God. Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you become slaves to righteous living. This is great, Mary Alice. <clears throat> Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is working us toward a whole big discussion. We have, we've seen very clearly what salvation is. We are declared righteous because of what Jesus Christ did for us. But what he's going to remind us of is that we are going to have a struggle the rest of our lives between two natures. That old nature that we inherited from Adam and the new nature that we have at salvation. Well, Thursday we talked about how that the scripture says here we are dead to sin. But I want you to notice something. Even though the Bible says we're dead to sin, all of a sudden Paul makes some things very clear. He says, do not let sin control the way you live. Well, then it must be possible for a Christian to let sin control the way he or she lives or else Paul wouldn't have had to make that statement. He said, do not give in to your sinful desires. That means a Christian who is dead to sin can yes, still give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. And already you get the point. He, mm -hmm. he is saying that even though you are dead to sin, dead to the power of sin, that it is possible to struggle with onboard sin and he goes on to say that we have to understand that the parts of our body are actually to be given over to God for righteous things, not, not for sin. And then he goes into what we're talking about today. He is saying we used to be slaves of sin. He said we have to choose then, because we have the freedom in Christ, we have to choose to serve the Lord. And I always think about the Bob Dylan song that we sing at New Spring every once in a while. You've got to serve somebody. You know what it makes me think of? Uh, one of your, and you've done multiple uh, sermon series on this subject, but you talk about appetites. You know, appetites are developed. Yeah. And we can develop an appetite for sinful things, even as a Christian, or we can work on developing our appetite for godly things. Um, and, and you see that um, there's all kinds of choices you can make. The, the music that we listen to, the media that we look at, uh, the relationships that we have that might lead us in a particular direction. But we craft our appetites. And I'm afraid in our culture, the uh, prevailing notion is that you just they're just there and that you no. don't really have any control over them. But we know that you do. It's true and it's powerful. And because you make your appetites and your appetites are going to make you. That's true for every one of us. I mean, it's just in the essence of full disclosure and just talking about this from the physical realm. I've kind of let, I had kind of let my nutrition get in a really bad place for about a year. Um, I had a number of eye surgeries. It's not an excuse, but, uh, you know, in the last year. And because of that, I got slowed down working out and started gaining weight again and then got in some really bad habits. And, you know, I started, I would start the morning with a particular pastry that I would stop mm -hmm. and get and all this and my weight ballooned up. And then the worst part about it was I felt horrible. And you, you're a great student of nutrition and, and I've learned so much from you. And so uh, when we got back from vacation this year, um, probably about eight weeks ago, six, eight weeks ago, I just decided, you know what, I'm gonna get my nutrition in shape. And so I started eating very healthy, I mean very healthy, very disciplined. Um, and I was thinking about, I, I don't even crave that pastry. In fact, now that pastry seems seems awful to me. I got in late last night because, uh, you know, I spoke in another another town and had to drive in late. You drove, drove, drove me and drove me back. But I got in last night and I looked and there were five tomatoes on the cabinet. And it was like, I was so hungry for those five tomatoes. And, and, and you know, if somebody looked at, where I was and look at where I am now, they would say, oh, Mark's behavior is totally different. But what's driving that 
It's because my behavior changed. Now my appetites have changed. And the same thing is true in the Christian life. If we develop an appetite for uh, carnal stuff or worldly stuff, I mean, a, a Christian can develop an appetite for entertainment that's wicked, you know? And the next thing you know, they crave that. Or we can develop an appetite for what is good and clean and righteousness. And, and after a while, it'll be amazing how we don't have to fight off Satan's temptations as much because we're not even hungry for what the world has to offer. Right. You know, why would we invite Satan to come in? And, and, and I think that a lot of times that we do that in a general sense. When we when we put media in front of our face and scrolling or looking or listening, uh, sometimes I'm just blown away by... Um, and I don't understand lyrics very well, but once in a while when I when I hear them, I'm like, oh, I can't believe. And um, so, you know, we, if we pay attention to those things, well, we can direct our appetites uh, to godly things. And and you know, it, I know this isn't true of you guys because you're you're watching this on Noah's window. But uh, a prevailing thought I think among Christianity is that reading the Bible is a little bit like taking a vitamin pill. Mm -hmm. You know, you just you just endure it. Uh, to say that you did it, but you're here because you love this, and and that appetite drives you. And uh, I know I get really excited when I see people that are excited to learn more about the Bible, to read it, to understand it. And it will. The Bible, God has promised us that if we get into this Word, it will transform us. Mm -hmm. And so I'm so excited that you guys are are on this journey with us, and that you're hungry for what uh, the Bible has to say. There's a power in, in obedience, whether we're talking about doing the right thing or not doing the wrong thing. It, it's never going to feel right at first, or, it's never, or at least our flesh is, is going to push back against it. But I've always said it's important to string, if we're talking about not doing the wrong thing, string some no's together. And if it's doing the right thing, string some yeses together. Because every time you can string no's together, when you're saying no to temptation, you just get a little stronger and a little stronger. And what happens if we say no one day and then yes one the next day and then no the next day? We we just never really develop that power, the power of that. Power. Which reminds me of that scripture <coughs> we just had last week, where, where Paul's talking about the you know the times that develop endurance. So we get stronger the more we uh, move the right direction and make the right decisions and push back against that sinful nature. I agree. Well, thank you for sharing this, Mary Alice, with us. I love these scriptures, and we're going to get a lot deeper into this battle between the two natures. And if you've never read Romans 7, you're going to be shocked at some of the things that Paul says about his own personal struggles. He gets very personal and very real, and we need that. All of us need that. So a lot of great teaching coming up over the next few days. Well, Mary Alice, would you pray for us? Yes, let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you so much that we have your word to read and study and to get to know you better. And to uh, the, more we, the more we read, Father, the more we understand your great love for us and how wonderful that is. And I just pray that you would uh, help us to be mindful of uh, how much you do love us and what a wonderful opportunity we have to live for you in this life. I pray that you would be with each and every one of our Noah's Window family today. Help them through their challenges. Uh, and may this be a joyful day for many that are, are seeing you work. May they stop and uh, take account of the fact that you have worked on their behalf and we'll give you the gratitude for that, Father. For others that are just entering a time of, of difficulty, I just pray that you would uh, go with them and provide for them. Wrap them in your love. Draw them close. May they feel and know your presence. We'll be careful, Father, to give you all the glory and the honor and praise for all these things. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for praying for us, Mary Alice. Thank you for joining us on this Monday. God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless.